Thank you very much, and thank you, Lori, for this unusual and wonderful invitation. I really appreciate it. Um, welcome to the attention economy. Is there anyone here who does not have a cell phone with them? <laughs> so not one hand. We have about that many cell phones here. I was concerned that we would be seated theater style and you would not be happy that you would have to cheat and peek at your cell phone rather than being at a table where you can have it up and open legitimately the whole time. <laughs> For those of us who have been in those circumstances where you can't be looking at it all the time, we all feel each other's pain at those moments. Um, we look at our cell phones in some estimates 46 times a day. I've seen more recently a figure that it's 80 times a day, and that varies from demographic to demographic, and I won't ask you how many here look at it more than 80 times a day, but I have a hunch that you won't be alone. We look at our cell phones so much that we imperil our lives. <laughs> there is uh, actually in, in many places you can be, uh, there's a traffic ticket in Honolulu, 35 bucks for crossing a street while looking at your cell phone. And there's a new word that's actually been added to the Oxford English Dictionary, which I only learned uh, this week. Smombi, which is a portmanteau for smartphone zombie. So this kind of behavior is, well, the jig's up. We all know what we all do. And why do we do it? What is the reason? Well, look at the wonderful things that we can do with our smartphones. And what our smartphones do with us is make us high. That is a tattoo of d uh, dopamine. And it is now well established that little squirts of dopamine are what we get from our exposure to cell phones. And we keep coming back to get that dopamine, we also keep coming back because of fear of missing out. There are, I don't know what the other languages uh, spoken here do for acronyms for that, but uh, that's the one we use. I imagine the concept is similar. We can't stand the idea that something is going on somewhere and we're not knowing about it, we're not part of it. But if, so that anxiety is coupled with the reality that there is too much information out there. It is not possible not to miss out. And the exponential growth of information is, is where I want to start. So from the beginning of time until two years ago, there was this much data. And now that you know that, all you have to do is extrapolate forward and you can see why the amount of data in the cosmos is doubling every two years. There is today as much data, as many bits of data as there are stars in the universe. That's already where we are. Uh, every single day, two and a half exabytes of new data get produced. 
those are, if, I don't know if you all can see from the back, it's uh, what two and a half exabytes is equivalent to. My favorite is 250,000 libraries of Congress worth of data every single day is being produced. So all that's being made, and what are we doing? We are in front of our screens when we are not sleeping. If you look at the, uh, this uh, adds to more than 24 because in some cases uh, people are in front of two screens, two different kinds of screens, as many of you here today are at the same time. But uh, if, if you ca double count that, in a typical day, media and consumer technology screen time for each of us on average is 12 hours, and you know some of you are guilty of more. This is Herbert Simon. Uh, he is an economist from MIT, and in 1978, he won the Nobel Prize in Economics. And among the things he's known for is a particular insight. He said, what information, we've been talking about the growth of information, what information consumes is the attention of its recipients. Information consumes attention. Hence, a wealth of information creates a poverty of attention and a need to allocate that attention efficiently among the overabundance of information sources that might consume it. So allocating attention is that something is something that people have to do in the context of a hypertrophy of information. And if attention is scarce and made scarcer, then an attention economy in which attention is allocated and bid for is the context in which we live because of the growth of information. Now, there are limits to our attention. It is said, well, we multitask. Uh, why should we think that there are limits on our attention? Well, it turns out that we don't multitask. That's a common phrase, but it has no empirical basis in reality. What we do is oscillate rapidly between different things, and to the degree that we do that, our quality of performance degrades. So, in fact, attention is a zero-sum game. If we put it over here, we're not putting it over there. There's another limitation to our attention. Um, I don't know if you know uh, the work flow. Uh, I once asked him how you pronounce his name, and he said, call me Mike. Um, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi is talking here about the, another limitation to our attention. Actually, our nervous system is incapable of processing more than about 110 bits of information per second. And in order to hear me and understand what I'm saying, you need to process about 60 bits per second. That's why you can't hear more than two people. You can't understand more than two people talking to you. So we allocate our attention with those limitations. How do we allocate our attention? Well, we do it in two ways. One is what one would think allocating attention means, and it is a top-down. It's known in uh, uh, neurobiology as top-down attention. And it is centered in specific parts of the brain, in the thalamus, the anterior cingulate cortex, and the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. 
capturing attention, though, is something else that happens. We allocate, but things gr grab and hold our attention, whether we want them to or not. That is known as bottom-up attention, and it is run by an entirely different part of the brain, the limbic system and the amygdala most prominently. So two different systems. Daniel Kahneman, another Nobel Prize winner in economics in 2002, uh, his uh, great book, Thinking Fast and Slow, talks about two different kinds of cognition. So one he calls system one, which is that bottom up grabbing our attention. It is involuntary, automatic, it is emotional, it is subconscious, and it is fast. It gets there first. The other kind of attention, which he calls system two, is logical, effortful, and slow. So you can imagine that if something has the power to occupy our attention, think of a, uh, an army occupying foreign land, if something does a land grab on our attention, that power is substantial. So what has that power? Well, danger has that power. Fear. If we were not afraid of that several hundred thousand years ago, we would not have survived. And danger today still grabs and holds our attention. This is CNN Breaking News. <laughs> not pay attention to danger. It is in our hardwiring. And so is the case with sex. So I have a scientific illustration of how that was the case in uh, prehistoric times. And skin makes you look. That was true then, not just look, uh, true then, and true now, if you're advertising a, a perfume, that will get your attention. In fact, even the word will get your attention. Whether you want to give it or not, you're there with that. My clicker, there. <laughs> Novelty. New things, if, if something goes into our peripheral vision, we, as uh, roaming around the savanna, needed to know about it and pay attention to it. And here I have the, uh, an illustration from the noted social anthropologists, uh, Stanley Kubrick and Arthur C. Clarke, about noticing the new. And to this day, even the word new gets our in attention. Go to any market and look at the products on the shelves. New, 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 even if they're old, old, old. New gets us to pay attention to them. Play. We are creatures who play. We share that with our primate ancestors. <laughs> We are suckers for the opportunity to play. Uh, there is a, a bird bone flute 40,000 years ago, knuckle bone dice 2,500 years ago. 
the uh, Dutch sociologist uh, Huizinga said, we are not homo sapiens, we are homo ludens. We are the creatures that play. And from that, he uh, finds all aspects of culture descend from the play instinct. And it's, it's, it's a pretty useful and relevant, we love to have fun. Children's games. Video games, so there's uh, 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 Pokemon Go, the virtual reality game, the most popular one in the world. We love playing stuff like that. We love word games. We love playing at sports. We love to rock out to music. We love the play of illusion that art delights us with. Uh, this is at the La Brea Tar Pits promotion. Will Ferrell and a saber-toothed tiger. Is Lori still here? Uh, I uh, wanted to give her a plug. But comedy is another thing that we love to play at. Above all, and this separates us from our primate uh, uh, ancestors, story gets our attention. If I say once upon a time, I've got you. You know that must have begun at the caves around the fire, people telling stories to each other. My favorite story about stories, stories about attention, is Scheherazade, in which her keeping the caliph's attention was a matter of life and death. He was going to have her head chopped off in the morning, so she started telling him a story, and when morning came, she had not finished it, so he didn't kill her, and so she came back and kept going, and her stories nested into her other stories for a thousand and one nights. And uh, keeping and holding attention uh, in, in that case was a kind of power that she exercises that story still has today. So danger, sex, novelty, play, and story, all those can grab our attention can occupy our attention whether we want it to or not. Now it turns, so that power is a political power because attention can be mobilized, attention can be weaponized in the public realm. That power is an economic power because attention can be monetized. Our eyeballs can be sold to advertisers. And it's also a cultural power. Attention can be valorized through culture and education and religion and other kinds of storytelling uh, that help us decide who we are and who we want to be. So, there's a word in the English language, it turns out, whose definition is the action of occupying attention. Agreeably, we'll come back to that. What is this word that means what I've been talking about? Entertainment. That's what entertainment is. The ability to grab and hold your attention. Agreeably, in this case, I don't think means it's all happy stuff because we can be terrified or weeping or in suspense or in grief and still be entertained and have our attention held. And what about the opposite of entertainment? What do you call it? when your attention is not held at all, when there is nothing. There's a wonderful experiment done a few years ago. People were uh, 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 asked to give themselves an electric shock and they were asked, would you pay money not to do this? Everyone said yes. Then the people were put into a plain room for 15 minutes. They couldn't stand it and three quarters of the men 
and a quarter of the women, while they were there, decided. They would rather shock themselves than be bored. So bo something that's boring is the opposite of having your attention uh, grabbed and held. So in an attention economy where information is hyperabundant, when attention is scarce, and attention is power, nothing wants to be boring, and everything wants to be entertainment. News as entertainment gets your attention. Food as entertainment. These are from uh, Vespertine, the new number one restaurant in Los Angeles. Spectacular. You don't even know you could eat them. <laughs> Hunger as entertainment. The biggest loser, a big hit around the world. Shopping as entertainment. This is the uh, Nike town uh, in London. It's like a theater, a theme park. Science as entertainment. Anti-science as entertainment. Architecture as entertainment. That's the Lucas Museum of Narrative, which will rise a uh, hundred yards from here. That's the Motion Picture Academy that some of you will visit uh, a museum on a field trip right, right next to LACMA. That is the new portion of this museum. Politics as entertainment. You know what's coming. Uh, there was a story in the New York Times during the primaries, uh, which stayed with me. Uh, it was about, I'll, I'll read this because some of you can't see it. Uh, it was during the primaries, Clinton and Sanders were fighting it out, and uh, a reporter asked someone at a Democratic rally, who are you for? Well, uh, uh, he said uh, he'd much prefer Trump to Clinton. Though he said he disagreed with some of Trump's policies, he added that he had watched The Apprentice and expected that a Trump presidency would be more exciting than a boring Clinton administration. A dark side of me wants to see what happens if Trump is in. There is going to be some type of change, and even if it's a Nazi type change, people are so drama filled. They want to see stuff like that happen. It's like reality TV. You don't want to just see everybody be happy with each other. You want to see someone fighting somebody. Looks like he got his wish. Culture as entertainment. Uh, some of you may know the Culture Track Survey. There is a new, uh, they've been doing it for a number of years. There is a version for 2017, which has just come out. And they went to 4,000 people. It's a demographically scientific sample. And they started by doing something very interesting. They showed a list of 33 activities to these people, and they said, they asked them to define the space of culture. What would you call a cultural activity from the list? And the findings were really pretty extraordinary. The activities that they considered culture included museums. This is above 50%. I'm just going to focus on that. So historic attraction museums, 
art and design museums, natural history museums were all there considered as culture, but so were community festivals and street fairs and music festivals and public and street art and food and drink experiences. The uh, Culture Track summarized that finding as culture can be anything from Caravaggio to Coachella, from Tannhauser to taco trucks. Richard Thaler won the Nobel Prize in Economics this year, and one of his notable achievements is the idea of mental accounting, that people have budgets for different things in their mind. It's not just all my discretionary time, they divide it into slices. So people have a mental budget for culture. And what's relevant about all those different things being included along with museums is that you, the museum world, coexist with that other cultural space as your visitors and potential members define it. What do they look for when they come to a cultural experience? Having fun is number one. They want to play. Interesting. Interest in the content. They don't want their attention to wander. It should be interesting. Experiencing new things. They want novelty. Feeling less stressed. They don't want their attention to be with their regular stresses. They want their attention grabbed and held by something new and different. Learning something new. Feeling transported the way storytelling transports you to another place. So if those are your visitors and members, or potentially so, they're saying something to you in those findings. They're saying, entertain me. That's what that information comes down to. What are you going to say to them? What do you say to them now? The idea that entertainment is toxic has been around since Plato. Uh, that book, 1984, is still in print, pre-digital era, because it's so powerful. But entertainment is not just a pejorative thing. Entertainment means being able to hold attention. So that is my suggestion to you, that being explicit about the promise that you offer, that you will not be bored here, you will enjoy it. It's interesting, and if you don't think so, we'll give you your time and money back. Now, put that in next to your ticket booth in the lobby and see how people respond. My guess is that no one will ask you for their time and money back. No one will come to you and say, we're bored. And if that does happen, uh, please email me. I look at my cell phone at least 60 or 70 times a day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matty. I mean, we, we can tell we are next to Hollywood. I'm sorry? I mean, we are in... You are in Hollywood. Yes, we are yes. in Hollywood. But we are also in a museum. Yes. And the topic of the, I mean, thank you for such an amazing talk and really, uh, you know, to wake up every, everybody. The topic of this conference is beyond walls. So would you say that we should all entertain our visitors? I think you should all hold your visitors' attention because you have lost 
if you don't do that. They come here because they want their attention held. You will disappoint them and miss an opportunity. You can get their attention in a way which is like a carnival or a street fair, or you can get it in the most sophisticated, uh, aesthetically advanced, politically exciting way, but one way or another, that's what they want, and I don't think it's intrinsically dumbing down or uh, in any way necessarily contrary to your mission to entertain. Yes, but it's, it's a big step for, I mean, in Europe, in, in, in many museums, it would be really a, a big step to go forward to do that. But um, I promise to be provocative. <laughs> to, to do what? I promise to be provocative. Yes, yes, I know. So do we have any uh, question for Monty? Yes. If, if you can introduce yourself and stand up, please. I'm Ulrika Khamisa. I'm from the Aga Khan Museum in Toronto, and it's not really a question, just a heartfelt appreciation. And I think what you are saying, that many museums are still not prepared to go down that route, that doesn't mean that we don't do it. I personally come from a curatorial background and am very, very sad that so few curators are at this conference this time because I think that what you are talking about has to be at the very heart of everything we all do in our sector. So my heartfelt appreciation, it was amazing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Does anyone want to say that again? <laughs> okay, another question. Or comment, or yes, there is someone in the... Yes, I mean, we need educators to be entertainers, maybe. Yes? Hi, my name is Katie, I work here. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm wondering if you think that entertainment and education are tied if they operate separate spaces, because I've also heard the term edutainment when those things are combined and some people feel very strongly that that's inappropriate or, I don't know, I'm just curious what you think about those two things. There is a field called entertainment education, and its premise is that when messages are in entertainment, they are more impactful on audiences than when they are delivered in other media, like uh, conventional nonfiction or in uh, news. And that's especially true in the realm of public health. All over the world, there have been for 40 or 50 years now, public health campaigns to discourage uh, domestic violence or to encourage family planning and so on. And what those countries have discovered is that if that message is embodied in a soap opera uh, by a character that you admire, you are more likely to be affected by it and to change your knowledge, your attitudes, and your behavior than if the government sent a message out or your doctor gave you a message like that. I spend more than half my time and have for the past 17 years using that entertainment education process here in Hollywood, where we work with pretty much every TV show, every network, and every studio to at least make sure that it doesn't cost them anything to be accurate when they say things in their scripted entertainment. And sometimes to get them to pay attention to things that they might not ordinarily do, like climate change, like the risks of nuclear war. And for the last five years, we've been doing this in the two other largest centers of entertainment export in the world, in Lagos, the capital of what's called Nollywood, and in Mumbai, the capital of Bollywood, helping them use their entertainment industries to spread pro-social messages to make the world a better place. So I don't think entertainment education is necessarily a downgrade of the idea of education. Thank you very much, Manti, for this amazing talk and for taking us to the next stage of uh, education. 
Okay. Thank you. Please. Thanks. Thank you, Manti. Thanks.